last session for the day and so forth. So as I said, Mark Olila here in the session, which simple tips deliver the biggest value to developers? Um, we've got a very good panel here. We've been talking about this topic quite a bit uh, during the past couple of days. Uh, my background a bit, I've been in the industry since last century. Um, uh, was chairman of a company doing physics middleware solutions that eventually technology got acquired by NVIDIA and is in all their graphics cards. Uh, headed up Nokia Games Publishing um, in the early days, so helped basically bankroll. I think we were one of the first sponsors of this event and uh, everything. And uh, now I've been doing a lot of board work, private and public, and uh, uh, now working as a CEO of a social uh, network for video gamers. So enjoy this theme very much. It's very uh, passionate to me about how you help developers, both in the technology side and the corporate side. I'm going to ask our panelists to quickly give themselves a quick introduction to the audience. Not a novel, just straight to the point, and then we'll get straight into it. Hey, I'm Jeremy Glazeman. I uh, grew up in Chicago. I pretty much grew up in arcades. So, of course, I started the industry in coin-op. Uh, and somehow I ended up in free-to-play mobile games. Hi, I'm David. I run the Europe office for Game Will Come To Us, which is a mobile gaming publisher. I started out as a gaming journalist, um, came from pen and paper RPG background to reviewing Japanese RPGs uh, on the Super Nintendo, and now uh, we're doing free-to-play mobile games. Hi, I'm Marek from Madfinger Games. I'm doing games since 2000. I was uh, mostly programmer uh, and lead programmer in the uh, for like the big console games in 2010, we set up a mobile studio, and uh, you know now I'm a CEO. <laughs> uh, hi, my name is Martin Ryoshek. I'm from Slovakia, and I'm currently working as a UX game designer at company Pixel Federation. Okay, thank you. So, just want to get a sense in the audience here. Like, uh, how many people are actually uh, developers, coders? Hands up. Okay, and how many people are sitting in the management side of the company? Couple, and then how many people are working at a company that's less than two years old? Okay, one. Okay, less than five years old? Okay, a couple, and then, okay. And then how many people are working at, let's say, a publicly listed company? Okay, so we've got a sense there. Okay, so one of the first things that came to my mind uh, when looking at the title of this uh, talk is that, okay, you're starting a studio. What are the, let's say, the five tools or three to five tools that you think are needed when you're starting a studio? Like you're starting from scratch, you wanna become a developer, and it's not about only the programming, it's about setting up a studio. What are your actually three to five most important tools that you recommend that the audience walk away with if they want to go ahead and start their own studio. Leave corporate, do your own thing. So randomly, let's start with uh, the one with the mic. <laughs> uh, well, I have some experience with this. Uh, not really actually starting a studio. I'm just a programmer after all. But uh, a lot of the projects I've worked on have actually was there on day one. So big point, I was there when they opened their studio in San Francisco. Uh, the studio that eventually became uh, Nexon, I was also there on day one. So I've started a lot of projects on day one. Uh, and so things that have really helped me out, you know, starting from day one, what, what do you need to be successful ultimately? Um, so of course you need some game engine, unless you're building a game engine, don't build your own game engine. Like, unless that's your product, don't do it. It's, it's a terrible idea. Um, also, uh, build system. I think build system on day one, how are you going to test this thing that you're making? If you can't, especially on mobile or on console, if you can't put it on device, you know, very easily, you're not going to play it, and then you're not going to get, you know, the, the the feedback even from your own uh, team, let alone from other players. So, really, build system on day one, I think, is very important. Uh, and then a way to collaborate. I I was thinking about this from a tools perspective, but uh, Mark made an interesting point uh, about collaboration. So I was thinking, you know. Google Docs, Google Sheets, uh, Source Control, Jira. What are ways that you're gonna share ideas with your team? And Mark made a good point. Just sitting in proximity with your team is very important, right? So, especially in the early days, so you can uh, really share all of your ideas. Um, yeah, I think that's also very important. Okay. Mm, yeah, uh, I also worked on, on, a, on a game game project from the day one, and I've been working there as a lead game designer, so I can tell that my favorite tools are pencil and paper, definitely, then whiteboard so we can share the ideas. So communication with the team is really essential from the day one. And once we move about, uh, 
what we move uh, next step further then I would say for me as a game designer is maybe Adobe CC and then uh, Google Docs usually. And so Adobe I, uh, Creative Suite was that? Uh, creative uh, Creative Cloud, Cloud uh, yeah. mainly Photoshop and nowadays I'm playing around with Adobe Experience Design. Actually it's quite a handy tool to make really fast mockups, wireframes and then you can even make them a really simple fast prototype. So. Okay. Mark, <laughs> it's depending what kind of the games you want to make. I think if you are looking for this uh, answer, then you want to make some like the smaller games. So you need only Unity and you need uh, maybe Photoshop, but that's all. You don't need anything else. You know, you don't need like the Google Docs. You don't need management forever. Like the why? You know, just create the games and see if it's worth. If you have talent, and do it, and everything else will come later because when you will grow up then you will find that you have issues with the management, with the whatever. So you will find these tools and like to build it just organically. You know. And David, any tips? Um, I think I would agree with Marek, actually. I think the most important thing is to know what you want to do and then really follow that and make sure that it's about the craft of making games and it's not about like being the billion dollar exit in two years and things like that, but just focus on making cool games that you can handle with your team and your expertise on a scale that lets you survive and that you don't run out of money very quickly. So maybe money is also very important. Money. So the focus at just summarizing your answers is that don't use your, don't build your own SDK or own engine unless that's going to be your core product. And then fundamentally use some established products out there like Adobe Creative Suite, um, or, or Creative Cloud. Unity, um, is there a choice of Unity over Unreal? Is there any preference? I'm a Unity guy. Unity? Yeah, see, I think it's really whatever fits your team. I mean, yeah. if you put together a team of Unity developers, don't use Unreal, right? Like, it's probably a bad idea. So really, you know, work to the strength of your team the best that you can. But they love Fortnite. <laughs> okay, just bringing that up. So is there, is, is there a Mac PC debate to take? Well, Mac, obviously. No, use like the, what you love to use. It doesn't matter. Yeah. I'm trying to cause a fight here. So okay, so um, what about like um, things like testing the game and so forth? Like any tips or tools specifically for that? And when you go live, is it anything different? Any tips or tools that you need to have in play for that? Uh, well, yeah, I mentioned having uh, you know the build tool set up so you can create these builds easily, but also things like. Um, Someone just mentioned it in the, the other talk. Uh, any way to get feedback directly from players. We used to literally walk out on the street and just put a phone in, in people's hands at like a coffee shop and be like, what do you think of this, of this thing, right? So any way to get feedback from people, um, you know, there's a million ways to do it. Mm. And the build tools, can it be more specific? Um, Jenkins is, a, is good, it's totally free, it's open source. Uh, we use Team City uh, at Gram Games, um, which is also very similar to Jenkins. Um, they're not hard to set up, and once you set them up, you generally don't have to ever touch them again, which is nice. Um, but ultimately what you want is one button, and the thing is ready to play. Okay. So, Marek. Oh, it's the same like the like previous. Like the, if you are like the four guys, you probably don't need any tools for the QA. You will just play it and fix it immediately. Mm. And it's like the most fun. You know, later when you have 100 people, then you have to implement all the stuff. So we are using, I think, target process mostly for tracking. And, uh, you know, I love the, the previous thing. I like to just do things immediately. So we've got, like, a publisher on the panel here. And, uh, like, this is about which simple tips deliver the biggest value to developers. So I'm going to ask the question, like, uh, should you self-publish or should you publish? I think that depends on you and yeah. your company and your goals. I mean, mm -hmm. um, at the end of the day, it's a question of burn rate more than anything else. If you're small and you don't need a lot of money to sustain yourself and you just want to keep growing very carefully, step by step by step, maybe like Marek did, then that's great. If you can do that, that's fine. If you want to scale and have a like go really big and not deal with all these different functions that a publisher can take care of for you, like localization, marketing, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera, then maybe you should talk to a publisher. So it's really up to the studio that you are running. So in your just to summarize there, like if you need localization, marketing, 
as a top, like what's the third item you'd consider as a, the money as a big reasons to go to a publisher? Yep. Okay, Marek. I don't know how the business is working now with the publishers because we are not using them and we never <laughs> want it. Uh, I knew how the business was run in the consoles and uh, in the early years of the mobile, they even didn't want to like the uh, do like the, some kind of the development costs, you know. So they were only taking the shares, uh, revenue share, and uh, they used their own user base. Uh, and we decided like to not go for it because it wasn't worth. It's like the you know it's like the double edge going with the publisher because the publisher can kill the game if they don't like it, if they don't like the KPIs, they don't care too much because they have a lot of clients. You know, and they they open like the business. You know, it's like the, it's just business, and uh, you have to decide it. Like you said, like the you know, it's, if it is worth, if it's uh, like the mean something, if there is some extra value, because even in the past, some games like the early grow up. I think even Rovio didn't publish like the first games, or some other companies like the Half Break. You know, so they like the run with the publisher. They get a lot of money, a lot of downloads and they move to the self-independent and self-publishing, you know, so there is a lot of ways how to do it. Martin? Yeah, yeah well, I'll, uh, maybe I got one more question. Uh, uh, the thing is that uh, a lot of studios, they do self-publishing and they are doing it pretty well, but mm -hmm. they do it, uh, that publishing on the local market, so, you know, uh, basically Western de development studios, they do publish in Europe and America, but uh, what would you do if you wanted to expand to Asia? Because it's it's kind of like a mystic box how to get there. Yeah. Don't expand to Asia. <laughs> <laughs> okay, some very straightforward answers here. So I'm, I'm going to go to David. So David, like uh, following on that point, like uh, we've created a great game. Like you're working for uh, Gameville, like Korean company, great access to Asia and so forth. Like. Uh, how do you solve that problem if you've got a great Western title and you think it's possible that it'll go into Asia? What's the tips you would give to the developer to work with you? Well, so uh, first I'd like to backtrack a little bit because I think um, it's very careful to run into like confirmation bias with mm -hmm. a lot of the independent guys that are now doing pretty well because uh, companies like Madfinger or Rovio or Supercell started out at a time mm -hmm. when the mobile ecosystem and the gaming ecosystem itself was very different than the way mm -hmm. it is now. So like 10 years ago, you could probably self-publish and then be lucky and have a good game and um, grow your business very strongly, whereas nowadays it might be a lot harder if you don't have the experienced team and don't have a lot of funding to really self-publish and market and get visibility because it's just, there's just so much out there, right? Um, the biggest indie game of last year is Fortnite. Those guys have money, you know? Um, <laughs> of course, they don't need a publisher, you know? Um, they can be a publisher by themselves by now. So, um, and then nowadays looking at the distribution issue, a company like Gameville, we're always looking for a global deal. We don't want to do an Asia only deal. Mm. We want to do a global deal. Mm. So we want to have a um, development studio that we work with um, where we can have global rights. But it also has, has to be a deal that works for everybody because um, if we as a publisher take too much and then don't care about the game and kill it and whatnot, then this can never be a success because the developer will know and the developer also has to care about the game because otherwise we give them money and then they don't deliver a good product. So it always has to be a good balance for both sides. And if your deal isn't structured like that, if your contract isn't like that, if you don't have this feeling working together from both sides, then it's not a good deal. So I'm gonna ask you, David, like one thing I've learned through negotiation is that the best negotiation ever is when both sides are slightly uncomfortable. You mean you haven't given up everything, but you're still, uh, this hasn't worked. And if it's both sides, then that means a real negotiation has happened. If people walk away both happy, then probably someone got screwed and so forth. So what's the best way to negotiate with a publisher then? What are the tips you give? Well, I think you should go in high in mm. any negotiation, whether it's your salary or your publishing deal, because mm. then you can, like, go in with the maximum you want and know what you want and then, you know, find the middle ground wh where everybody can agree. Uh, I think I would also say, depending on your studio background, be sure to have somebody who knows what they're doing from a business and legal perspective. So whether that's an agent or a lawyer or something like that, get that. If you're a small studio, if you're like creative, artistic people, then just hire somebody to help you with that. 
Uh, agents usually work on commission, so they will only get money when there is a deal. Um, lawyers might cost money, but it will save you a lot of money later on because there are also publishers out there that might want to screw you and then you just want to be safe, you know? Mm. So um, get the professional help and know what you want. Well, that brings us to an interesting question then. Like, uh, you started off with the studio, you've got hopefully some developers and so forth. Like, how do you go about expanding the studio? Like, do you hire people? Do you subcontract? Uh, what are the resources you consider most important for the studio? Like, what tips or war stories do the panel have in that area? Uh, well, in the early days, um, the the best success I think I've had is when you have a couple people sitting in a room, you know, able to, to, to start every day. Uh, for instance, I worked on a project where uh, the original design was outsourced and the designer was working remotely uh, and it didn't take long before there was just total rebellion. We're like, no one, we couldn't get feedback on it, no one wanted to work on the game. And in the end, we, we tossed it and the team uh, developed uh, their, their own design internally. And I think you'll have much more success in the early days if everyone is working together, so I would, it, you know, uh, it's kind of obvious uh, to say, but you know, you always want to hire the best people. But I think it's more important early on to hire absolutely the best people that share some same vision and put them mm -hmm. in a room together. Okay. I think I think we were special in some case because uh, when we set up studio, we were four guys, and uh, we get like the initial seed investment which was like the for 11 months, and then we had to make the money. And we decided that this is just try because we were not businessmen, we were programmers, developers, and, and like the, these kind of the guys. And we said like the, that we need to, we, we have to deserve to survive, basically. Mm -hmm. So when we were getting people from other companies, we promised that we will have at least one year um, of their salary in the account because we were taking people from the really big studios and our friends and we didn't want to screw them. So we were running like this, you know, we were not running on the funds, for example, fund rounds, you know, like the something like this. So always like to make the money, we have it, we can like to move up, you know, we can have like the better games or like the more complicated games. If we need more people, okay, so bring them. And we were just running like in steps in this. And yeah, that's all about this hiring. By the way, the best thing is like to get the friends, you know, or people who knows, like on the beginning, like the, who you know, you know, who, who you can trust, not like the somebody from the agency, you know. So, with the, like uh, David brought up a brilliant point about that the industry has changed quite a lot over the past 20 years, um, and uh, the question comes in is that like technologies have changed like many years ago you're developing your own game engines now it seems everyone is either using unity or uh, unreal um, or roblox if you we were here earlier um, so question i have is uh, like what else has changed because like i think maybe even development processes have changed and uh, what's important has changed in terms of the um, what you're delivering to the end consumer um, what, what recommendations uh, do you have uh, other than uh, uh, what works for the team? Because what works for the team could be just an old pattern they learnt from 15 years ago which is not being used today. So I just want to get your sense of uh, everything from the development processes, prototyping, development style. What, what war stories again and tips do you have in that area? So I think one thing that has changed is the way how we talk with mm. the players. Mm. Uh, 20 years ago, there's like no communication, right? Um, nowadays, I think players really expect um, to have a direct line to the developer. So as a, as a game developer, you should consider how you want to do that, how you want to make yourself available to talk with your gamers and how are you going to keep them up to date on what's happening in the game? How are you going to explain the direction you're taking with the game that is live? How are you uh, setting them up to like buy your game or install your game before it's out? I think that's very, very important, and I feel like a lot of um, developers or development teams, even like inside our company, um, they don't want to talk about their game. They wanna, don't want to talk about like new features because it's not fixed yet, or they don't want to show the new character because it's not the design isn't final. Um, but there are ways around this uh, where you can still share information with players, and I think it's really, really important to to think about. 
how are you going to do this if it's just a Discord chat that maybe so you do as a small company or like you're really big, you know, whatever. So PR engagement strategy. with parts of the user base from the get-go as you're in the development process. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, I totally agree. Uh, in our company, uh, our community management department is quite large, actually. We get, we get around, I'm not ra uh, right now I'm not up to date, but somewhere around 20 people, and every community manager is dedicated to the, to the specific game, and they are in a basi basically they are in a daily touch with, with our players, with the most engaged players. And uh, there are many advantages of this approach for us. Uh, um, when I did uh, some UX presentations, I said that our key to success is the community management because for us it's it's like a source of, it's the source of qualitative data. And even our CEO, he still has around like 5,000 friends on Facebook. And a lot of people are still messaging our CEO uh, about the updates in the game that they don't like it and they, they like that and, and that and other stuff. And it's quite funny because once we do an update, they, they really like, they always send a message to him like, thank you, Mr. Shitsko, for amazing update. Mm. And well, back in the days when they were a small studio, he, he used to be a graphic designer and he participated a lot on our projects. But nowadays it's like, once we do a good update, they send a message to him, thank you, Mr. Shitsko. But once we mess up our updates, they, they send him a message like, oh, your team, they are so stupid, like you should fire them. So, you know, we, we never, you know, our CEO is the best in, in the eyes of players, but we should get fired every, like every two weeks. I, I, should, uh, I shouldn't have been in that company like five years ago, I guess. So great source of, uh, uh, it's a great source yeah. of qualitative data. I think the biggest change change is like the when we move from the pre, pre, uh, premium games to the free to play, and basically it change everything. You know, when you are playing the premium games, you feel the value immediately because you spend a lot of money on it, and uh, it's still visible. Like the I played a lot of Dark Souls games, I finished them, but the first like the initial like the level, I almost killed them. Like the throw it several times away, and I hate them. And ba basically, they didn't care. You know, I have to find everything by also by myself. Uh, in the in the free to play, they don't feel this value. You know, it's like the more about the consuming stuff. They have a lot of games. They can try it, download it. Everything is fast, and you are fighting for the player like the since beginning. You know, really. And uh, this changing the design, like the I call it, like the from the designer centric design to the player centric design. So you have to always think about him, like the, what you are doing to him, you know, what uh, they should feel, you know, or what they are feeling, you know. You can have like the really great ideas, but you really have to like the thing, what's the player behavior, how he will understand it. And uh, it's, it's not easy, you know, because a lot of people are still doing this. I have super idea, I will implement it, but you can screw a lot of things. So this is the biggest change, you know, what I see. And it's not easy which, by the way, is something that a good publisher can help you with <laughs> because they might have a producing team that has done these things in the past. Awesome. Yeah. Sorry. Awesome. When I, when I think about the, uh, the CEO comment and so forth, I was uh, thinking, yeah, I'm one of those customers because like, I love Clash Royale. I play an hour of it every day at least. And on this past weekend, I actually emailed Ilka Barnett and directly about something I found. And he said he'll fix it and everything like that. And he responds all the time and I'm grateful. But brings me to the next point, Supercell. In the press, there's a lot of talk about the Supercell structure, the cell system they have in producing their games and all that. And I'm just thinking about the organizations that you've seen in the past and what tips you have now going forward. Uh, in terms of development processes, again, like is it like agile, waterfall, or do you go for the supercell? Is there a best practice you recommend today as a tip? Well, I can tell what I wouldn't recommend, uh, and that's the waterfall process. Mm. That that's the something that it it is still work. Basically, it's implemented in many companies. Uh, never the, uh, whatever. If you do the games or applications, um, waterfall. Nowadays, it looks like it's, it's not a good for development of games because, you know, if you, if you approach the development with the style that ga game designer develops a feature, he writes the documentation, then he gives it, gives it to our direction, then 
it goes to the developer and developer cannot find answers to his questions, then it gets back and the whole feature development gets delayed uh, like like twice the of the original estimation so mm. so that is the something that I definitely do not recommend and so the tip is that uh, once you start developing a game, always try to do the review, the uh, the retrospective uh, mm, retrospection. Uh, try to do the feedback with your team: what worked, what didn't work, and always, especially as a product product, product manager, you should try to find the new ways uh, how to how to approach your current needs of the project. Because at the beginning, you might be doing well with with your with your waterfall, but after I don't know two or three months when the game mm, uh, when your team is bigger when you you got a lot of features in your pipeline maybe you should you should try to find new solutions because you can get stuck easily uh yeah i mean i agree i wouldn't recommend waterfall but it doesn't mean it couldn't work for someone i think the game of sutra a few years ago did the something called the game outcomes project that found absolutely no correlation between you know that sort of what a team uses as their development process and the success of the game uh, and that, I thought that was actually really compelling. Uh, I think it's much more important to be flexible to um, really the, I think the main point of taking from the supercell model is the team is autonomous. The team is allowed to make its own decisions. Mm. They're empowered to change the process. And again, I think uh, especially working on small teams, the best thing you can do is, uh, is change your process. If, if something's not working for the team, right, like on, uh, what we used to do is maybe every two weeks even look back at the last two weeks what worked what didn't work and don't be afraid to change the process don't lock yourself into anything if it's not working then you know there's no reason why you can't change it I've always um, had the uh, view that uh, a process is an embedded reaction to a previous stupidity <laughs> and uh, the flexibility is uh, important here when, when we look at uh, the type of people coming into studios today, we've got uh, naturally the programmers, we're starting to get economists coming in to deal with free, uh, the free-to-play economy that's getting set up in the free-to-play game, games as a service now. Um, but there's one area which has sort of uh, been talked a lot about, uh, and that's like data-driven, the companies are becoming more data-driven, there's quantitative data, data qualitative data, uh, user experience is becoming a, a discussion point. Like. Uh, do you have any thoughts or comments around uh, these activities and which tips you recommend should be embraced now and will become more important as we go forward? This is a call to the UX. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, okay, so um, just two things. Uh, the first thing that UX uh, shouldn't be uh, implemented as an afterthought. It's, it's the common practice in the game development that we do the game, we do the game feature, and then once we are satisfied with our game, we call some guys who are, you know, oh, we need to fix our UI, can you, can you look on it and improve it? And it's kind of hard, uh, hard to work with this type of process because you cannot change the game feature, and it's a UX, it, it, it's, or let's call it like player experience, and once you're not able to change the game features, uh, it's kind of hard to. Uh, it's kind of too late. Yeah. So it, it it happened in our in our company. It happened quite often that they they gave us a task to help them with some kind of uh, screen. I don't know. Like let's call it a shop, and we were not able to help them on the small mobile device because the game was too complicated, and they they were struggling. So the sooner you implement UX processes into a development process, the better. And the other thing is that. Once you do the user research and you get the qualitative data, it is not an opinion, it's the data. And that's the common thing that happens. You do the research, you have a lot of findings, you see that, oh, okay guys, you go to the development team. If you, the best, the, the ideal scenario is when you, walk, uh, when you work together simultaneously, but uh, if it's not the case, then you, know, you get the findings, you tell them, guys, this is the problem, this is the problem, this is the problem. And as long as the game designers haven't been the part of this user research, they, are, they, they think it's just an, another opinion and they think their opinion is more mm, the better one because they, they are game designers, so they think, oh no, but it shouldn't be like that, it should be done like that and that, and they do not respect it as the uh, quantitative data. That's the thing. 
and there's always the struggle to uh, to 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 put the co uh, to put the qualitative data on the same level as the quantitative data. The struggle is real. Yeah, the quantitative data is telling you like what's happened, but the qualitative is the why, and the why is important here. I'm going to open it up to the audience now. Uh, as we get into the last bit of the stretch here. I know you want to get outside and enjoy the sun. So, um, questions from the audience? Down the back there. Oh, up the front here. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, going back to something you touched on in the beginning about the algorithm. I mean, there's obviously a very big stigma about algorithms and how they work, but how do you think Oh, well, I, I mentioned maybe not starting with outsourcing, but clearly there's, uh, there's going to be a need for outsourcing on a lot of small teams at some point. Uh, but in my experience, it's best to, by the time you've reached outsource, you, you know sp very specifically what you're missing and, and what you need, and you use that, the external resource to sort of meet that requirement. Uh, but when you're looking for creative feedback from outsourcing, I've had much more mixed results. And again, it comes back to like, you know, not really trusting the feedback because that person isn't part of the team. A lot of times you get, uh, you, um, uh, you get stuff back from, out, from outsourcers that the team just isn't happy with and maybe doesn't end up using anyways. Uh, if they're not, if the outsourcers aren't given, you know, uh, very specific guidelines on what the team actually wants, at least that's been my experience. Um, we we always were against the outsourcing because it was slowing us down. We were like just working, hammering, and nobody have time to take care about the outsourcers or like the, the guys like to control them, feedback them, you know, and these kind of things. Then we find out that we cannot find like the more people, for example, or we don't want to. So we find uh, ways where we can use the outsourcing, mostly about the modeling stuff, you know. But you have to find somebody in the company who really giving feedback to them, you know, because then it can end like the crazy. Or we are doing like the outsourcing, for example, what we're doing for the testing the UX. You know, some really good guys who was giving us feedback, like the what is uh, confusing, you know, what they don't understand. They were doing focus tests, and so you don't need to do it by yourself. But we never outsource uh, programmers, for example, or some other stuff. You know. I think it's important to just uh, take care of the things that you are outsourcing and understand that even when you give something and then it comes back, it still is work also on your side and you should try to build uh, the best possible process to deal with the outsourcing uh, material to get it back into your game. I mean, um, in a way, a lot of the things that the publisher does is outsourced from the developer because maybe the publisher does your localization, maybe they do your marketing, um, but it's not like, yeah, just do my localization and then it's going to be fine. Uh, you still have to be involved. You have to provide locale files in a good format so it can be automatically translated instead of just providing a shitty Excel that then takes you years to put back into the game. You, know? you should think about how to set up your localization so it can be updated live on the fly online and not with like new builds. Uh, for marketing, you need to integrate SDKs into your game and provide tracking and think about the points in the game that you're looking at to analyze. So whatever you outsource, it will also always need to be managed on your side and you need to take it seriously. And I think that is something that uh, many people forget. Yeah, uh, just to say one example in our company, we have a localization manager in our company and uh, we got a platform, basically the tool for localization, and our uh, and basically this uh, this localization manager works with our players. So we got a lot of players who are uh, lo localizing our games in exchange for gems, usually because they are really uh, dedicated. They love the game, and. They, they really lo love to be part of our um, development process. And since they are localizing, they, they get to know, y you know some extra information because once they have to translate something, oh, this type of feature is going into the game. And then they like to share with the other. So it's, it's, uh, we were quite lucky it's to find it. It's like yeah. you st talked about earlier. It's about engaging them early with feedback, yeah. but also getting them actively committed to the game. Any other questions? Okay, so I'm going to finish off with then two tips. Like, uh, 
One tip is uh, fundamentally that we didn't cover was don't have a two-person board. Have a board that has at least an odd number of people so that you've got corporate governance in the company. I've seen that, that go very, very badly. And uh, I think fundamentally the other thing that, uh, a little tip that ties to the outsourcing is that I've known studios when they've started up, they've actually, every person involved in the studio in the beginning was actually on contract, they weren't employed. And then over time, as they've seen the commitment, they actually then moved on to full-time employment contracts. So that was a matter of sort of starting off as an outsource model and then moving to an employed model so that they could actually see what functions they wanted and believed were the most important at different stages of the company. Okay, with that, please thank the panel. A lot of great thoughts and insights.